Hello and welcome folks back to another video. Um, this is part three of our series on the new ball and beam kit build. So this video is going to be all about this mess here. So all about the electronics and how I'm going to make them properly, you know, professional looking for, for this whole project. So this is how I usually start with most electronics um, for these kind of projects that I do. And that's just with, you know, a breadboard and jumper wires and, you know, <laughs> plugging components in and running wires all over the place because it's quick and easy, it's non-permanent. You can just plug and play and, you know, mess around with things to get things working. So as I said, though, it is not permanent. Um, and that's a problem, obviously, if you want to have something that's sort of a display piece or you want to have it as something that you can just pull out and turn on and, and have it work, uh, this is not an ideal solution. Um, firstly, it would be a waste of <laughs> breadboard and jumper cables because every time you did it, you'd have to have something like this. Um, and then it's bulky and it's messy and you know the wires go everywhere. You see people, a lot of people will spend a lot of time cutting little wires to length and plugging them in. Makes it look quite neat and pretty, especially if you were doing, you know, tutorials or something like that but obviously it's not you know a permanent solution necessarily so in the past what I've done for permanent solutions um, so this is my old ball and beam rig um, you can see a link a video below where you can see where I actually talk about this in the past and I go through the electronics but yeah so previously when I wanted to make something permanent effectively I would use this stuff which is called protoboard so basically it's just these regular spaced holes in a PCB and they're plated all the way through so you can stick your components in with the kind of they have all the standard pitch spacings and you stick all your components in and you can solder them up permanently and um, so they're basically there forever so this is actually pretty much what I'm going to need for this it's basically the exact same type of circuits power as a capacitor um, We've got a port here for the DRV8825 stepper driver and a port for the Nano, and then these are for sensors. So our electronics look pretty similar, except we've only got one port that we need here for sensors. This has three, and we've got the yeah, socket for the, for the Nano, and we have a socket for the DRV8825 stepper driver. So this is fine, and it does work, and it's a permanent solution. But if I'm making a kit, this isn't exactly, you know, kit friendly. Like I, I could supply my circuit diagram with the kit and then, you know, people could go off and assemble it themselves on a breadboard or they could assemble it on their own proto board if they wanted to. But what I really want to do is I really want to make a PCB for it that I could supply with the kit and that either me would be fully assembled or would have some parts assembled. Maybe you'd have to solder some stuff on yourself. But I just think that would be really cool. It's also something I've, I'm not gonna say I've never done it before. I very briefly did this, you know, 10 years ago when I was studying electronics in college, but more recent years, not touched it. So I want to design a PCB <laughs> and I'm gonna try by the end of this video to have shown you something around that. Um, but there's one thing I need to do first and that is I need to clean up some of the wiring on this. I wanna add a couple of extra features because that's the other thing. We, even with the proto board stuff and with this stuff, you can add things to it sort of as you go. But with the PCB, it kind of has to be final. So before I actually commit to making the PCB, I want to make sure that I've got all the wiring that I want, including all the features that I wanted to have. So one thing that this doesn't have right now is the ability to dynamically control the um, stepping granularity of the motor. So the micro stepping of the motor. So at the moment I have it with jumpers jumped so that it's in one thirty second stepping mode, which is the finest micro stepping it can do. Um, I'd like to make that so that it's modular basically. So you can change what it is by writing code on this. You can change what the stepping is because that might be something you want to experiment with to see if you can change how fast or slow the system responds by changing the micro stepping. Um, I also want to have the enable pin permanently set to low here, which is the whole thing enabled. Um, I want to also wire that back into the um, microcontroller so that you can the microcontroller can decide when it wants to turn on and off the motor completely, because at the moment, when you connect the power, it enables the motor straight away, which I don't necessarily want that to be the case. So with all that said, first thing I want to do, I want to just do those quick bits of wiring. I'm going to write some code to make that all work. Once I'm satisfied with that, 
I'm going to go and I'm going to show you guys progress I've made so far on designing the PCB. And I'm going to talk through a little bit about the software that I'm using to do that and the whole process and some of the pitfalls and the <laughs> absolute insanity that's involved in doing this. This learning curve is quite steep and it can be, seem quite intimidating. So I'm going to do my best to show you what I've kind of figured out so far and hopefully you learn something from that. So first thing, I'm going to do that little bit of uh, new wiring. Okay, so what I did there, very quick and simple little bit of wiring, it's basically enabled kind of two things that are quite useful. Um, I haven't shown you the rest of the code for this yet. I'm going to show you that next actually after this. I just want to show you this a little bit first because it sort of changes the way that you can use the machine, that little change I made, and also um, I can show you the difference that it actually will make in practice. So um, if I plug it in, I can start to demonstrate that. So first thing it did was it, basically set the motor at the very start to, for about two seconds so that it's not quite on and it gives you some time to calibrate the sensor because it uses a common filter under the hood which you'll see in a second so there is a little spike at the start which I wanted not to be there and also I wanted the motor to effectively be off uh, when you turn the machine on at the start so that you can move this around a little bit to position it finally if you need to so you see here were more or less what is at the set point, so it's not really doing much. If I give it a little flick, it'll start moving to get itself to the set point. Now, I have this in one thirty second stepping mode, which means this is a two hundred step motor. So effectively, one revolution becomes six thousand four hundred steps, or really six thousand four hundred pulses from the controller to the motor to get it to step through one revolution. So. I have it limited to be able to sweep through about a quarter of an entire revolution. So it's uh, an eighth forward and an eighth backwards, which is um, just kind of a safe range so that I won't break any of the linkages or anything like that. So what that stepping mode change did was I wired all of the stepping mode pins to the Arduino, which means digital pins on the Arduino can now tell the stepper driver what stepping mode to be in. So now with one line of code change, in the config, which I will do now, which you can't see, but I'll do it live. Um, I can now change that stepping mode. So that's uploading, and we're going to be running in a different step mode now. So this should be in one sixteenth step mode, and there we go. So this is one sixteenth step mode. You'll notice it's a bit louder, and instead of it being so, it's basically there's half as many steps now. Um, for one revolution. So it's now 3,200 steps per revolution, but you'll notice that it's a lot faster as well, right? So now the PID controller isn't actually tuned for this, so it can, will be a little bit haywire, but you'll notice that it actually settled a little bit faster. It's just kind of a lot noisier. <laughs> you can mess around with your current settings and stuff to make that a little bit smoother, but yeah, so there you go still doing the same job so the PID controller is still roughly tuned for both settings but yeah that works there so one thing I'll show you then as well if I hit the reset button and we start from scratch again so now the motor and then it clicks on which is after about two seconds the sensor has calibrated itself so you can finally set that if you want to to make sure it's level previously you couldn't because as soon as the whole thing was powered on the motor was energized and you couldn't actually move it by hand I'm gonna turn it off now just because that's really annoying. <laughs> but um, yeah, that was basically all that change was. Um, but what you can do with this then in your setup, if you were building this in the kit, you'll be able to choose what stepping mode you wanted to work in, whether you want to use a really fine step, which will make this really smooth motion, but it'll be a little bit slower. You can make that trade off or whether you don't care about how smooth it is or how loud it is, you could make it, it work in a lower stepping mode, which will be faster, but um, yeah, and also, sorry if it's faster as well, but there's fewer steps, you'll also have less granularity, so there'll be kind of jerkier movements on it. But the speed really might overcome everything and might actually make it perform the best. Um, so yeah, that's just a little prime on why I did that and why that's kind of important. Um, so yeah, next thing I wanna do, I'm gonna show you guys a little bit about the code and I'll show you how I implemented this um, stepping stuff because some of it's kind of interesting. 
And then, yeah, going on from that, I'm pretty happy with this circuit now after doing that work. So I think I'm going to finalize the first V1 for the PCB, and then I'm going to show you guys that. So that's all coming up next. Okay, we're going to have a look at uh, some code here for the ball and beam rig. Um, it's pretty simple. I'm not going to spend a huge amount of time uh, on this. I just want to give a little bit of, because I realize I haven't shown any of this, but I've talked a bit about it. So I just want to show a little bit about how it works. And yeah, I'll go through some of the little details in it that are a little bit nuanced, a little bit kind of strange. Um, but yeah, the code's very simple. It's mostly uh, using implementing a bunch of different libraries that exist to do different things. There's a whole pile of config and yeah, what it actually does, very simple. So I suppose what I'll do is I'm not going to go through the config all up front because that's just going to be a little bit obtuse. But what I'll do is I'll start down in the main loop for the code. So it is quite short. It's uh, less than 100 lines. But this is, these five lines are pretty much the guts of the entire thing. Um, and the rest is basically all just config and stuff. So let's start off. Um, the basic principle of how most of these kind of machines that are basic PID control works is you start off with, you know, reading some sensors, which gives you you know, some idea of what the machine is or where the machine is in space or something like that. In our case, reading the sensors detects the position of the ball along the beam. Um, you will usually do something with that uh, sensor data. You might transform it in some way, do some small computation on it. You'll use that as an input into your PID controller. Your PID controller will compute some value and then you will move in some way that is... Uh, you know, the output of the PID controller will tell you how to move in some way. So there's a couple of function definitions here. The first one for the re reading the sensor, quite simple. All it does is it calls out to the sensor library, which is, this is a library for the HCSR04 um, acoustic position sensor. It's a very, very simple library under the hood. What it does, you basically give it two pins, uh, the echo pin and the trigger pin which you'll see labeled on the little modules themselves. Effectively, what it does is um, the trigger pin sends a pulse to the little module, and then the module responds with a train of pulses of a certain length. And depending on the length of what comes back, that is what gives you the actual, that's what gives you the, the distance of your uh, object. Um, so yeah, it's quite simple, a little abstraction. You can go and have a look at the library um, and it's yeah, it's very basic what it does, but it's just a handy way of making your code a little bit cleaner just to use the library. Um, so yeah, the only thing you have to do for that, yeah, you just need to, I don't think there's anything. Yeah, there's no real config. You just give it the uh, instantiate the class with the trigger and the echo pins, which I have defined up here as constants, pins five and six for me. Um, yeah, so this library works. It has this uh, command dist. So when you read the dist command from this, it returns a double uh, value, which is like a floating point number. And the reading is in centimeters. So that's my units here. Um, I have a very simple little uh, method or if statement here, which just throws out any values that are under two centimeters because that's the dead band of the sensor and anything over 25 centimeters because I'm know for certain that's not an accurate value because the length of the beam is only, I think I only have a travel distance. So I think it's about 22 centimeters along the beam. So if I, I'm certain if I get anything over 25, it's absolutely wrong. Or it might be 24, 23. I can't remember exactly what it is, but for certain, if you get some spiky value that's over 25, we'll just, we're just ignoring it. So then the ball position I have set here, this is just a global variable, which I define up at the very top. So this will be just a floating point value, which just has records the position of the ball, uh, updates it every time there's a valid sensor reading taken. And that value is taken by taking the reading and passing it into a Kalman filter. I'm not gonna get into the details of the Kalman filter. They're quite a complicated topic. If you want to go off and research them yourselves, you should because they're really, really useful and they're really interesting how they actually work. But it's beyond the scope of what I want to talk about right now. All I want to say is that I'm using a, oh, that's the definition for the library. I want to go up to the library. Yeah. So I'm using the simple Kalman filter library, which is really, really useful, really easy to use. You have set up an instance of the class. You pass in a couple of these config values, which I've left up here and yeah, then it basically takes care of all of the 
all the filtering underneath the hood effectively what it does is it uses like um sort of a stochastic process where it figures out like probabilities of error and things like that and using that it's able to determine what is the actual value and what is you know uh, a value that's likely to have high error in it and it's able to ends up being able to give you very precise results that's pretty much all you need to know about it these configs again i'm not going to get too deep into what they mean but uh, you can change these values to change the performance of your uh, filter, which changes the properties of how it responds. So you can change how quickly it responds and things like that to uh, changing values. Anyway, it's just another uh, library I'm using here, which helps smooth out the, op uh, the acoustic position sensor because the acoustic position sensor is actually quite noisy in normal operation. So adding the common filter really helps smooth that out and give consistent values and accurate values, I should say. Um, okay, so we read our sensor, set our ball position. Then we're going to do a little bit of maths here. Um, it's, it's pretty simple. We calculate a value here, which is the ball position that we've found in centimeters minus 13.5. 13.5 is it's sort of basically like a, an offset point that effectively gives you a middle, effectively transforms our value so that it were plus or minus zero from the center of the beam. So it, when the sensor reads 13.5, we're at zero along, which is effectively the middle of the beam for us. It's because we're just reading a value from one end. Um, the reason it's called H, you'll see in a second. Um, we then calculate another value, which is A, uh, and that is the stepper's current position, which comes from the stepper motor library that we're using. Um, and that then is multiplied by the radians per step. So radians per step is, we we know it's, so it's a 200 step motor. So if it's a 200 step motor, you know that each single step is one 200th of 360 degrees. So you can transform that into radians and work out how many radians you've moved per step of the motor. The stepper current position tells you uh, in plus or minus values, what the current position of the motor is in steps. And so you multiply them together and that'll give you an amount in radians, which is the angular displacement basically of the motor. Um, and there is, so this is, a, there's, there is a sort of a transform in here as well because the angle of the motor isn't exactly the angle of the beam. There's like a, there's a ratio to it. It doesn't necessarily matter that much. You can play around with it yourself if you want, but you know, it's, they're they're proportional so we say anyway so that's all i'm really interested in here and sorry and also i've built that into the calculation for radians per step i'll show you that in a second <laughs> it's not it's not too bad um so what else yeah so then the input here so input is another global variable that i've set up and that is also it's a pointer that's used by the pid library that i'm using to basically track the input value and the input value as it changes over time. So what I'm setting here as the input, I previously was using just the ball position. So just this, just this H value. Um, but it was, it wasn't getting great results. And what I decided was I actually wanted to make the input a function of not only the position of the ball along the beam, but also the angle of the beam itself. So you've got kind of two parameters that get combined into one value for the input. And what I decided what that value should be is it should be the, so this is where, if you know a little bit of maths and trigonometry, it helps if you have your beam along a set point in the middle, if you tip it up or down, the position of the ball along this beam is effectively forms a right angle triangle. So the position of the ball we've measured becomes the hypotenuse of that right angle triangle. The angle A is the inside angle of that right angle triangle. So what I've decided is I want the angle along the bottom of the right angle triangle, which is what that the, the adjacent angle. So this is the trigonometric function for getting the adjacent side, um, which is the hypotenuse times the cosine of the angle which is also why this has to be in radians because the cosine function uh, accepts a parameter of an angle in radians. So that gives me a value for the input. So for my value for the input, it's effectively the linear offset in the X, I'm gonna call it maybe the X uh, axis 
of the ball, which we compute based on knowing how far along the hypotenuse it is and what angle the beam is at. Um, and what that does is that helps to stabilize things because now we don't just care about where the ball is, we also care about what position the beam was at and that will change. That's a, a, not just a simple linear function. It changes things up a bit and it helps stabilize the whole thing. Um, I'm not gonna get into again details about why, like there's different ways you can process this sort of stuff and make it work. This happens to work quite well here. Um, I did something similar in my inverted pendulum video, but yeah, so that's just how, how this works here. Again, something you can experiment with yourself. You can change different functions, look at different things and see if you can figure out maybe does the vertical offset value, maybe you can use that to help you here as opposed to the X one. Who knows? Let's see. Um, so anyway, once we've computed the input, uh, we then go and we run the compute function of the PID controller, which effectively... I'm not, again, I'm not going to get into what, how a PID controller in this works in this video. I plan to do a very specific video on that in the future where I'm going to write the code line by line for a PID controller, implement it, and talk through exactly how it works and what it's doing. For this, you just have to assume that the PID controller at this point recomputes what the output value should be based on the input. That's it, really. Um, and then at some point, then or so, once we've got that computation done, we then call our move command. Our move command here is again, it's very simple. It's just a calls out to the stepper library that we're using and run to new position basically says, whatever position I'm at now, keep taking steps until I reach my new position. My new position I'm defined as the output with a minus sign in front of it, which is just to do with the direction that the motor spins. Depending on what way your motor is wired, it may it may be positive output or it may be negative output. Just because if you just simply flip two wires of your stepper motor, it'll spin in one direction or the other. So, um, yeah, in my case, when I wired this up to test it, minus happened to be how it worked. Um, I may add a config parameter up here, which is just motor direction, and it's just a constant, either one or minus one, and you can just flip that to change that if it uh, if yours is working backwards effectively. So yeah, that's pretty much it. Um, the PID thing, I didn't really talk about that at all. Again, it's pretty simple. Um, you create an instance of the class. Uh, it requires three uh, inputs, three, or it requires three pointers you pass in, the input and the output. So the input is a variable then that you're going to be modifying. And then the library will modify the output variable, which you can then use to do stuff with. You have a set point. In many cases, your set point will never change. It's often a static value. In our case, it's zero, for example, because we want, say, we define that zero point to be the middle of the beam. So we always just want that to be zero. We're never going to change the set point. But there are things you could do. So you could, for example, wire up a potentiometer or something, which would change that set point so that while the machine is running, you could be changing that set point around and it would uh, move the position of the ball along the beam and it would then try and stabilize it at whatever it, it was set to. There's also methods of stabilization whereby if your system is quite unstable and there's a lot of noise in it, you can actually make your system oscillate sort of around a point. So it'll oscillate around, stably oscillate around a point. And you can do that by actually changing the set point at a certain frequency and your machine might oscillate around it. So that's another thing you can play around with. Other things we have in here, we've got our KI, KP, KI, and KD gains. So these are the PID gains, have them defined up here. Again, I'm not going into these because I want to do a whole video on exactly what these actually mean, but just be aware that these are basically the knobs you can turn to adjust the tuning of your PID controller. So these are these three values. By changing these, you completely change the characteristics of how the machine will operate. Um, okay, is there anything else I've missed? Well, so yeah, there's the big uh, blob of config. Um, am I going to go through this? <laughs> uh, maybe I'll talk about some of it. Yeah, okay, I'll talk about a little bit of it. So yeah, one thing in the config, there's a bunch of motor pins and all set up up here, which is basically just hard coding which pins connect to which things on the board. This can be totally changed depending on what you have, way you have things set up. Um, these will be set for the 
PCB that I'm going to make because obviously the traces will have direct connections connected to the different pins. So you'll have to use these ones. But if you're doing this on a breadboard, you can make these whatever ones you want, um, depending on if you have extra hardware set up to do other things, maybe. Um, this thing here, this is quite useful. This is basically a little map which sets up the stepping modes. So you see I have step mode zero. So this is full step mode. Then this is half step mode, quarter step mode, um, one eighth mode, 16th and 32. Um, so by setting this value here from zero to five, you can change what stepping mode you're in, which is effectively just the index into this uh, two dimensional array. Um, the first one gives you the amount of micro stepping and then these are high and low values that will be written out to digital outputs, which then are get read by the stepper motor driver board and that config tells the stepper motor driver what stepping mode to drive in. Simple enough. Um, so other bits where that happens. So we have our degrees per step down here. So this is where another part where this is relevant. So we know it's a 200 step motor. We know this 360 degrees in a revolution. So depending on the step mode, this will give us the amount of degrees per step. Um, we multiply by the number of stepping we have. So that's either one, two, four, eight, 16 or 32. And then we can convert that to radians per step by multiplying the degrees per step by pi divided by 180. So that's just a standard formula. Um, a few other little bits. Yeah, so this is something, this is what I did uh, earlier. I talked about setting the uh, enable pin. So if I set the enable pin high here, it effectively disables the motor which means that when the first point of call, so the setup function is the first thing that gets called into where the Arduino is initializing your program. So it calls in here, it sets up these outputs and then it sets that high, so it disables the motor. So that gives you a little bit of time to adjust the position of the motor if you need to, so that the, basically the motor's coils won't be energized at all. It does this config stuff. It sets up the stepping mode Um, it sets, this is yeah, some config for the PID controller. Output limits, very important. Stepper min and stepper max will prevent the stepper from spooing wildly and snapping the linkages. Uh, it derives what is the maximum amount of steps it can take, either positive or negative, which basically tells you, it's telling the PID controller what's the highest values, negative and positive that it is allowed to output. Um, I've determined that about a quarter of a revolution um is about as or sorry quarter revolution yes a quarter of a revolution is about all i want to happen so there i have this set so it's one eighth of a rotation plus or minus uh, and that value then for stepper min and stepper max gives us about a quarter of a revolution and that's the amount it's allowed to turn adjusted obviously for how many micro steps we're taking and what else have we got oh yeah last thing then so this is a delay loop in here that runs 10 times with a delay of 200 milliseconds. So it eff effectively pauses the application for about two seconds. And in that time, it reads the sensor uh, 10 times. And the purpose of that is the Kalman filters, they, they have an initial state, which is kind of incorrect. And what you actually have to do is you have to add samples to it. And then it very quickly settles down to an accurate state. So what I'm doing here is I'm just filtering that out um of the pid loop basically so what that would do is if i left it there'd be a big spike at the start and the pid controller would overcompensate its very start so you'd turn the machine on and the pid controller would instantly kick the ball which i don't necessarily want it to do that so this just does an initial read makes a nice smooth steady state and then the application starts and with that we do our enable pin set it to low which turns the motors on so that's basically it. I think I talked about this for way longer than I thought I was going to. I was hoping that would be a hell of a lot quicker than it was. But anyway, I hope that's useful. I hope it gives you some insight into how this works. This may not be the absolute final code that I publish alongside this, but it'll be something like this. And I think I've talked about a lot of the areas around it. If anyone has any specific questions about anything I'm doing here, feel free to ask me in the comments. Please note, I'm not gonna publish this code just yet. Um, until the entire project's finished. Um, so yeah, if you're coming looking at this in maybe a year's time, the code might be available to you. But if you're watching this when it's released, the code probably won't be available just yet. 
Um, so sorry about that, but I want to wait until I have it all basically finished before I publish any of it, um, just so I can be certain, you know, that it's all in the right state. Um, okay, cool. So we're done looking at this little bit of code. The next thing I want to do is I want to show you a little bit of my PCB design software and talk a little bit about the process around that. So I will see you guys in a few seconds. <laughs> Hey guys, just a quick note. I realized just after recording that last segment just how long it's gotten, and this video has just gotten way too long. So I'm actually going to cut it here. I was hoping to talk through a little bit about this uh, PCB design uh, software that I'm using, talk about the, the schematic and uh, the whole process of going through it. That's going to have to wait till the next video. Um, so I hope you enjoyed this, and I hope it has been useful. If you've been looking forward to this, make sure to subscribe so you don't miss the PCB section because that's going to be basically I'm going to make that the whole next video and be talking about the designs talking about the entire process also talking about the provider I'm using to manufacture the PCBs and hopefully by the time the next video is coming around I'll have the PCBs manufactured and I'll have them in my hands and I'll be able to show you guys it and hopefully they work <laughs> so anyway that's it for now guys um, I'm going to see you in the next one bye bye